program is from AIT. Oh, I can see everyone's eyes. And I can tell Kendra's are blue. And mine are green. And yours are green. Mine are green. Mine are green. Yours are green. Yours are very blue. They're as blue as JJ's. And let's see your eyes. Green. I call your eyes hazel, Max. What do sort you of have hazel. My eyes? Blue. Blue. And yours are brown, Casey. We all have different shaped eyes and different colors. Helping children feel good about themselves and helping them recognize and accept the differences and the similarities between themselves and others are important contributions to children's self-esteem. Each of us has a sense of self which is developed from birth. Understanding ourselves is a lifelong process in which we are active participants. Each person's self-concept is shaped and reshaped by interactions with others and the environment in which they live. People with positive self-esteem feel good about who they are valued and accepted by others, secure in their relationships with others, and have the self-confidence needed to face life's challenges. As teachers and providers, you have a critical role in shaping your own self-concept and that of the children whose lives you touch. And I don't think anyone's missing today. I think we're all together. First of all, children need to feel good about themselves. They need to have a good self-concept. And uh, secondly, they need to know that they're loved and they're cared about. So a quality program would see adults um, interacting with children and children interacting with adults in a very loving way. It, while, it may, while there may be struggles and there may be some conflict, they know that they love and care about each other. And that's really important. And out of that comes a good feeling about themselves. The thing I'm most proud of is, uh, is um, her self-esteem. She really feels good about herself. She has a good sense of self. I mean, they've taught them so many things, and, and number one, be proud of who you are, and you are somebody special. And, and I think that will carry her a long way. I think the atmosphere is real important. I think you can sense from the moment that you step into a center, whether it's caring and nurturing, loving, um, whether there's mutual respect between the adult and the, and the uh, child and between children. You create a place where a child can feel safe, a nurturing place, a place where they can um, grow with self-esteem, independence, feeling powerful, a place where teachers and parents can create a community of children where they care about one another, where they can tell each other when it hurts, tell each other when they love each other, tell, tell, use their words for, for many different things. Yeah, what color is it turning now? I don't know. What's it look like? No, no. Okay. This looks like rainbow. Like a rainbow? That's a lot of the colors in a rainbow right there. And they do on that table is okay and great. And you need to respect it. You need to put their name on it. This belongs to you. You need to hang it up to dry. You need to get it into their cubbies. That's your responsibility because they're really too young to handle that part of it. Their job was to get themselves on that chair and to get that brush and the paint and uh, then you need to model the sequence of taking care of what what they've done. Chris, did you know who did this one? Well, no. No? Her name on it. Just wondering what. One basic thing I think is if they've done an art project or picked you a flower or whatever, put that up. You put, no, our kitchen's full of art projects. These are just from two days ago. We just switch them whenever we have new ones done and then they take these home to their parents. And of course, the comments on it, on it are your paper is really wet. You know, it's going to take a long time to dry. Or I noticed you used all the paints on the table today. Uh, it's never, is this a oh, beautiful picture? I mean, I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to look at it and make any value statement at all. But there's so many things to say.
there's so many things about it and you can make that comment and then you can give them just a little information to go along with it to to extend their vocabulary but very simple very simple you know that's interesting because Christy first put on her paint and then she put the sprinkles on top and you're putting the sprinkles and then the paint yeah, I'm putting the sprinkles on the bottom. Good idea. It works both ways, doesn't it? The words you use to describe what children do, their feelings and accomplishments, affect how they feel about themselves. Help children feel successful and important. Involve parents and families in the classroom. Offer children opportunities to learn about each other's families and promote acceptance and respect for the traditions and values of each child and family. Rachel asked me if the first thing I would do would be to tell all of you what I do for my work. Each child has two days and I send home a note to the family expressing what's going to happen and the different kinds of things they can do and then shortly before the parents come in I send home another note just verifying what's going to go on. For the children that for example like for Rachel today um, First of all, just looking at her face and her body language, I think you see in terms of self-concept and self-esteem, the pride, the uh, again, the empowerment, the importance, the respect that she gets by being person of the day. And everybody, the other kids know that and really adhere to that, that when it's their turn, they will be able to talk about their important things. Uh, I think it's important not only for the children, but the whole family, because the whole family comes in and shares and talks about what they enjoy doing, what their children like to do. Parents get to talk about their kids. They always love, they always love to do that. And we get to learn about each family a lot more. And I think for a group Group, it makes us closer and a little more intimate because we find out different interests or hobbies or sometimes even a crisis that's happened in a family that brings all of us a little closer and we understand more. So it's a, it's a sharing, but within that sharing we all get a lot out of that um, giving and getting. So I think for the child, for the family, and for us as a group, it impacts on all of us in a real positive way. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel. Rachel and I are learning how to play flute together right now. And recorder. And recorder. I'm practicing and recorder. You're practicing your recorder. Great. And to be very accepting of their families, their culture, their belief system, um, their traditions, their values. That doesn't mean I don't can't be honest about my own. And often meaningful conversation with the, with the children will will bring out everybody's ideas or family cult, family traditions on a given subject. But I need to be respectful of all of them and not pass judgment. Who's Annie. Name, whose name is this? Annie. Is this your name? Is that your name? Annie! It is A-N-N-E. Did you say like my name. Like your name, Amanda. That's right. Amanda is learning how to write letters right now. She, um, she understands almost everything that I say and the children say. But of course she doesn't speak at all fluently yet. But I didn't think that was reason enough to stop her from writing or to encourage her to write. So I am encouraging her to write and to get the notion of letters having sounds and being put together to make words. So that I think writing at this point for her has a lot of power. It's very interesting to her. She also is, has excellent small motor skills and so it's easy for her. So I think that, that her name and it being written has a lot of impact for her right now. Amanda, do you think this says corn? Look at it. Shh. Look at this. It doesn't say corn, does it? It says Amanda. Right? Amanda. Sure. See the A at the beginning? Yeah, that's your name. Now I'll write corn, and it won't have an A at the beginning. And that's her realization that I, you know, she thought I was writing corn, and then all of a sudden, bingo. That's what I wanted her to, to get that concept that, whoa, that's not corn. That's a word I know. That's Amanda. Good, thank you. So for her, 
I'm tying into that in her self-esteem right now. Man, do you know this one? Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how we run. My tape is Oh, there. that's good. You kept track yeah. of your tape. Here's all your barrettes. Now, the other children have other things going at this moment, and so I need to plug into their self-esteem, their, um, their sense of self, I should say, their, their current aspirations, their current drive, you know, where they're going. I plug into that at different places. Will's is uh, word games and fantasy things and storylines and... Um, Karen's is taking on the world. She's going to kindergarten, you know, so it's, I've got to acknowledge that part of her, her independence and her, her excellent abilities to deal with other people and take good care of herself and be helpful and all that. So I guess it's for different children, it's the different ways of acknowledging their, their strengths. This is what we, me and Will were practicing yesterday, how to brush your teeth with no faucet and no sink. And me. Yeah, when we go camping, you'll have to brush your teeth with Helping children feel good about themselves also involves helping them develop character, values, and self-control. Help guide children's behavior so they learn to take responsibility for their own actions, understand the consequences of their own behavior, and act responsibly toward others. Positive guidance includes balancing acceptance with consistent, fair, and appropriate limits and respect for children. Some people use the word discipline, and I use the word respect. Um, I think when you invite a group of children into a room and you respect them, I think they something happens to them. They take responsibility, in a sense, for themselves as much as they can. We really talk about respect and rights. And the children in the beginning of the year made up a set of rules, and they voted on what the rules should be, and they can practically run them off. Mem they have them memorized. And those are adhered to. They voted on them, and we as a class adhere to them. So they realize that they have input, and they're important, and what they have to say counts. And I think as a person, whether a child or an adult, that's just key. To avoid making too many rules. You know, uh, many times teachers feel that they've got to have 50 different rules, uh, even for toddlers, and say, okay, you know, that's one, that's one thing you can eliminate and you can avoid some problems. Just cut out some of those rules that they really don't even understand. I have rules, but a few basic ones. I don't have rules such as no hitting, no kicking, no biting. I mean, you could list a thousand. So my one main rule listed in my policies that the parents get is no hurting any other child. And that covers hurting their feelings, biting, kicking, scratching, poking, punching, you name it. And it's one basic rule they can remember. You don't hurt other children. Try to stress the behaviors caused. There's a reason for it. And if we can look at uh, some possible reasons, then we can better understand why the child is behaving that way. And then are we going to try to do something to, to alleviate or to redirect? you know, to change it, but in a positive way. I think you have to be very understanding, very patient. I think you have to put yourself in the child's position all the time. You have to always think of what that child is thinking and what their motivation is for what they do. Because one of our best role models once said to Peter and I, children do what they need to do. And that has sort of been our philosophy of teaching since um, she's spoken it. Sort of so. another way of saying there are no bad children. They do what they need to do, and when they do that, you don't need to judge the action, just discover what it was that drove them to do that. If they're upset, they're rightfully upset, and we just have to discuss it till we get why they're upset, and then we discuss it till we figure out why they're upset, and then we acknowledge, right, you're both upset. Then we look for the problem, uh, the, so the solution to that problem. Another thing that I do, trying to help with discipline, is being consistent. And that's hard, <laughs> very hard. Hard as a parent and hard as a provider, being consistent. Trying to treat everybody the same when one boy is so aggressive and one little girl is so meek and mild and trying to treat them the same and love them the same. But that you have in a family too. A big thing in my program is trying to treat the children in my home as my family. And I think if you 
do that, you don't have as many discipline problems if you can be consistently treating them all the same. I think it's important to teach young children or that un young children understand that it's okay to make mistakes, that we learn through making mistakes, or that it's all right. You know, we pick it up and we move on from there, that they have an understanding of life. That's the way it is in the real world. Um, everything doesn't always go okay. We all make mistakes and that's fine. What can we do the next time? I think that they uh, learn communication skills. They feel good about themselves. They. Uh, will be more open, they will talk to adults, uh, they're not afraid to make choices, and they're not afraid to express feelings, I think, which is very critical. I think many times children are really afraid to, to express feelings, and I mean even feelings of anger, you know, and I think it's healthy for them to do that. Uh, and one thing when I want to teach is I say, you know, when their child says he's, ang he's angry, you know, and don't tell him he's not. You know, no, you're not angry, you, and you, you're not allowed to get angry. You know, what what teachers need to do is to provide some avenues for them to express the anger. No, but here's a purple one and a yellow one. Mary, Well, why don't you tell Timmy to give it to you when he's finished? Okay. Timmy, I want the one Did you hear what he said? Okay. Looks like it's going to work out for you. Helping children learn self-control by treating them fairly and with respect will promote the child's self-esteem and support the development of character, values, and the self-discipline needed to get along with others. Learning to get along with others also involves recognizing and respecting the differences and the similarities between ourselves and others. All people are different, and we need to accept them as being different, whether they have a special needs, whether they're black, whether they're red, whether they're tall or short, but that we're all different, whether they're from single parents. You know, there's just so many things that if we just focus on, everybody's different, so let's all accept who they are. When it comes to cultural diversity and, and learning about other people's, other ways of life, um, other cultures, Food is a, is a tremendously valuable and, and enjoyable way to, to learn about that. And I've heard from many child care providers who've had great success with going to the, li the public library, finding some cookbooks, some international cookbooks for a certain theme. It might be Chinese, it might be um, North African, it might be uh, South American, whatever. Um, and putting together with the children activities around that you know that relate to those cultures and then having a meal that sort of celebrates that culture. I love this stuff, but I'm not gonna marry it. It's really amazing in, in a in a situation where children are involved in all these activities, how they will sit down and eat a very unfamiliar combination of foods at a meal that they might have totally refused to even consider eating if it had just been sort of put in front of them out of the blue. So I think um, that's another opportunity not only to help children learn about other cultures but to involve them in, in food related activities. I don't even know how to use them but I'm pretending I'm fine. Language is another enjoyable way for children to learn about the customs, traditions and values of other families, ethnic groups and cultures fill their environment with language, books, and stories that affirm and foster children's knowledge and pride in their own cultural identity, and that promote awareness and acceptance of cultural differences and similarities. Lo puedo sentir en el fondo de mi corazón. Okay, ¿qué figura es esta? Rectangular. No, ¿qué figura es esta? Rectangular. ¿Y este? Ovalo. ¿Y este? Estrella. ¿Y este? Triangular. ¿Y este? Miscuidacea. You're pretty close. That's Miscuidacea. Miscuidacea is turtle. Can you tell me what you remember this one? A green goose. A green goose. Animus. Thank you. Animus. What is Animus? Fox. No, Animus the dog. Animus the dog. Animus the dog. 
To listen for the words of the great spirits, then we will know what to do. We will know what to do so that once more the rains will come and the earth will be green and alive. The buffalo will be plentiful and the people will be rich again. I have heard the words of the great spirit, he said. The people have become selfish. For years they have taken from the earth without giving anything back. Food, language, and literature are all enjoyable ways to expose children to other cultures. Point out differences in gender roles, racial characteristics, culture, language, and physical abilities. Foster an awareness of the characteristics we all share, but also recognize the unique characteristics and abilities of each child. Help children understand that a person with a disability is different in one respect, but similar in many others. All children are children first. They all have unique needs and individual differences. And whether the child has a developmental disability or is perfectly a normally developing child, um, we have to understand where their developmental stage is at and be able to match our techniques to that developmental stage. As more and more uh, families uh, have two working parents, many more handicapped children are going into daycare centers, either families or, cent uh, families, uh, or uh, centers. And, um, there is a lot of fear on the part of uh, the caregivers that uh, they won't be able to handle all the problems that come up with, or supposedly come up with handicapped kids. I think getting over the fear of a special need, uh, special needs can be anything from, you know, a blindness to hearing to uh, speech to medical needs, that kind of thing. And I think just a basic um, awareness of it will help overcome this. Um, I think probably that's the biggest challenge is, uh, is the fear. And certainly when people learn about disabilities, it's not so frightening anymore. The more knowledge and skills we have, the better we are able to provide care. But what's most important is that that child has an environment in, with the, in which the adults care for them, in which the adults are learning about them and, and planning activities that will include them in the day-to-day -day operations, as well as planning things that are going to just challenge them a little bit and bring them a little farther along in their development. Is it big or small? I think that they did need to take extra time with Alex to make him feel more comfortable. Part of his fear, I think, of adults and other people is that they won't understand him when he signs. He's he knows that he signs and he knows he doesn't talk and he knows that if he makes a sign and somebody doesn't understand him, that it's frustrating. And so I think that the staff was very encouraging to him to to speak up and to sign when necessary and and uh, not necessarily speak up, but to indicate his needs. And they were very receptive uh, to that. And I think just having an open mind and, and not being afraid of Alex's need. So the staff were kind of concerned if they were getting across to him with him not responding to them. And we could tell that he w that he was um, understanding what staff was talking about. And as it progressed, Susan started to bring in um, a sheet that said what, what his signs were, and Allison would start to tell us the signs, and so staff became more comfortable as, you know, they worked with Alex, and Alex became more comfortable as they worked with staff. How do we do fish and sign? Just like this, just like a fish. Good. Can you guys do that? I think one of the things that's important for a child care provider to realize is they're um, um, looking to enroll a child um, with a disability in their home or center is to consider parents as resources. If you're afraid of, oh my gosh, how will I um, diaper or, or toilet train or, or, or toilet this child with a physical disability, think about right away that parents had that same problem and face that same challenge and the parent can probably help you with a lot of those concerns and give you a lot of the tips of the trade that they've learned in working with their own child. We also need to give a lot of support to parents of, who have handicapped children. Those parents are often at a transition time uh, with their kids. They've, they've had the difficulty of adjusting to knowing they have a child with a handicap. Uh, and now they're looking at their children getting older and moving into a wider community. Um, 
entering school or, or whatever is, is uh, uh, going to be that transition. Uh, and uh, that they need help to do that. They need support to do that. We know that it's wonderful for children with disabilities to be integrated into a normal child care setting. That's the real world. It's bringing them into the real world. Child care is a microcosm of the real world of society. If we can do that at a preschool stage of development through a child care center, we know it's having positive effects on the child um, yeah. with the disability, as well as on the child who is, is typically developing as a normal child. I think with Alex, I hope that he will give something back to the children with his signing, that they'll learn something from him, and that they'll learn just because he doesn't talk that there's not necessarily anything wrong with him, but that's not something to be afraid of or, or that kind of thing. So I think definitely he can give back. You know, it's kind of a give and take, and I think that the, the kids will be broadened by it, I hope. Like this, Alex, can you show us friends? Show us friends. Show us friends. Integrated child care helps children develop the ability to interact knowledgeably, comfortably, and fairly with differently abled people. Provide an environment in which all children are equally accepted and respected, where everyone takes pride in who they are. That's good. Just like two friends hanging on the hand. Good. Friends? You need to have self-confidence. You need to believe in who you are. And sometimes that doesn't always come easy, because caregivers aren't always real self-confident until they know, realize that that's what they're doing. But you need to do that in order to pass that on to children. That's essential that you have the self-confidence. If you don't feel good about yourself, if you're not a strong individual, if you're not whole as a, as a whole person, um, if you don't have good self-esteem yourself, you're not going to be a very effective quality caregiver. We've learned so much about being able to articulate what is quality child care, and with that has come an increased sense of professionalism. Somehow because we can speak about what we do and what we do well, it's increased our level, our sense of professionalism. We can hold our heads up and say we're really important factors in a child and family life. And we make a difference in a young child's life. We have an impact on a family. And we can feel really good about that. And that gives us an opportunity to feel even greater about ourselves and the profession that we work with. Take pride in what you're doing for the children, parents, and families you serve. Feeling good about yourself will make it easier for you to help children feel good about who they are. Enhance children's self-esteem through your words and the way you interact with other people. Help children learn the self-control and self-discipline needed to get along with others through the positive ways you guide their behavior. Foster children's awareness and acceptance of other people through your respect for diversity and your celebration of the uniqueness of each child in your care. You'll be helping children develop a sense of self and respect for others that will serve them well as they face life's challenges. The gifts of self-esteem, self-discipline, and an appreciation of the uniqueness of others will last a lifetime. Here we are together, together, together. Here we are together, all sitting on the rug.
program is from AIT. Third soldier said, with a bit of meat, it would be just like the soup we made for the king last month. She's got two sides. What's that mean? Becoming an effective teacher of young children takes knowledge of how children grow, develop, and learn. It takes specialized skills to care for children and to work with parents and other teachers. And it takes experience to learn how to best meet the needs of each child in your care. Hello, I'm Chip Donahue, Early Childhood Specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our focus today is on developing effective teaching techniques and strategies. We'll visit with experienced child care teachers and family daycare providers who will share with us some of their methods for working with young children. We begin with strategies for easing the transition from home to child care. When the parents come in the door in the morning, I always ask them what kind of an evening they've had, how the children have slept, uh, how they're feeling, uh, did they eat an, a good dinner. Um, if they've had anything to eat in the morning, if they've been awake for a long time, or if they're about ready to go down for naps. Um, and during the day, I keep a list. I keep a note for each parent with the child's name, the date, and what time the child had eaten, had dirty pants, had napped, um, if we are out for frequent walks, how much fresh air they've had, if they have seemed unhappy most of the day, I'll make a note of that so that they will know as, as well as I can tell them what kind of a day their child has had at my home. Each morning when the parent and the child come in, we have them fill out what we call as a daily sheet and they put the child's name uh, the time they came in, the time they plan on leaving, which helps us too in staffing. And uh, usually we ask the approximate time that they ate last and we have them write it down. Oh, yeah. Good. You put down when she ate last, yeah. that helps a lot. And she likes to be held a lot. Okay. All right. We'll do the best we can. But it seems like right after she eats, you know, like when she's real happy, if you lay her on her back, she likes to look around. Okay. Her pout. Okay. The right. ones like to do that too, I suppose. Okay. And then what we do during the day is fill out the daily sheet as to their changing, their sleeping, when they woke up, when they went to sleep, when they woke up, when they were changed, when they ate, what they ate. Five months ago, 5.15, 7.30, we just ate two. Okay. Hi, Nick. Whoa. You are a big boy. You Usually, when a two-year-old comes into the classroom, it's the first experience away from home uh, without mom and dad or a home environment. And I think uh, my major goal is to have that transition as smooth and as comfortable and as secure um, as it can be. I wonder what you have in your bag today. You never know, do you? Oh, can I take a peek? <sighs> this is a coincidence, JJ. I have something in the black corner, brand new cars and trucks, but none of them look like these. Should we go into the black corner and take a look at the new cars and trucks before the other children come? There's also a car in there. Sometimes it's very hard to leave mom oh, and dad, and right? it's really, I don't want to, you know, make any decisions about this room. Well, I think that's a good idea. Uh-huh. Oh, you're going to be so surprised. So maybe we'll walk around together and we'll look at all the things that are happening. And then I sort of put my hands in my pocket and sort of sit with them and take a lot of time and sort of wait for something special to happen the way they want it to happen. Sometimes that takes a lot of time.
but you need to give them that time to make a decision. And once they've made that decision, then to be with them and to nurture them into a positive um, play. I hear you had the flu. Are you feeling better? Young children need the freedom to choose activities and materials they want to work with. But children also need to learn how to make good choices. What strategies can teachers use to help children choose what they're going to do, carry out their plans, and then remember what they've done during the day? Looks like Peter needs a, some paint. Should we pass this down to you, Peter? Do you need this paint? The plan do review is valuable to me because uh, it uses a lot of oral language and it's pragmatic language. They need to have it. They need to use it in order to exist and in their own environment. And um, they do very well. Uh, they talk about what they've done. They talk about what they want to do, where they're going. The language is wonderful. Same time, time to think about what we're going to do. I'm Are you ready? Yep. Think carefully. I'm picking somebody who's sitting quietly, Jermaine. Do you know where you'd like to go to work today? Uh, the children start out at the beginning of the year. I ask them, where are you going to work? And often they point. The language is not there yet. They will point to the housekeeping area, or I call it the family area. And they will point, and I will say, what do you plan to do there? They're not sure. Um, that's just fine. That's where they're at. As they go along, I ask them um, to give me, to use their words more. Uh, that's something that I do a lot of in here. Use your words. And if they don't have their words, then I'll help them. I'll give them the words. I'll say, you need to say, or you might say. And then I use the words, and then they repeat it. And they have all this power. It's absolutely wonderful for them to use their own words. So we encourage, you know, use your words and tell me where you're going. The workbench. At the workbench. What do you plan to do at the workbench today? To saw. To saw, all right. You know, there's some more wood down in the box. You might want to look at some of those new shapes today, all right? See what's in there. You also have a big... Eventually, we set up a planning area, and we ask them to um, take a step further. And we give them uh, name cards with their name on it. They look at their sign first. They see the sign. They read their name. Not only that, they read their friends' names. In a matter of a week or two, all of the children can read their friends' names because they know all of their signs. It's wonderful. And now I cover it up, and they can read the names of all their friends themselves. And now we're saying, what does Sonia's name begin with? The letter S. Or whose name starts with? P. Portia. Portia, where are you going to work? In the house area. What are you going to do in the house area? Cook some cake. Every strawberry you cake. Cake. Strawberry cake? Ooh, I hope you invite okay. somebody to come. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As the year goes, um, we start writing our plans, and their written plan is simply seeing words, and they mark the area where they're going to work. And then I write in the words that they dictate to me. We do a lot of dictation in here. Yeah. Okay, let's do it together for a little bit. All right. Now it's starting to go. Do it by yourself now? Okay. Bye. 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 I think it's a small Here's one. Good for you. Okay. What did you find? Your planning, your planning boards up here. You know, some of these planning boards are missing. Mine's not. Here's Alex's. Alex, you should put yours up. Shalay, yours is missing too. You know, Sonia. Not this mine. That's yours. One, two, three, four, five. How many people are allowed to be in this area? Four. Four. We have a problem. Uh oh. How come I'm not in here? You're not in here? <laughs> are you just pretending to be in here? No. Oh, you just are sort of. Oh, I see. The children take their planning boards with. Um, Velcro on the back, and they carry them over to the center where they want to work, put it up there. When the center's full, it has four names, then the children have to choose another one. So they're making their own decisions about where they're going to work and what they're going to do, which is very powerful and um, also very appropriate for this age. Who would like to share today what they did Yay! at work time? Okay, I'll see your hands. Pamela, you brought something to share today. What did you do today? A horse. Yes. And how did you make that horse? It's some string. Some string? Did you sew it? Remember that when we made a quilt and we took the pieces and we sewed them together? Yeah. Show us what else you made in a basket. A teacher in a classroom who is uh, able to take an activity and teach children at all different 
developmental levels is a quality that I really admire, to be able to develop one activity or set up materials that a child who's at one level can work with and a child who's at a totally different level can sit side by side, they can work in the same place, extend and develop, and feel like they're each doing a good job with where they're at is, is a, I think, a really good quality for a teacher to have. I really like to, to set up an environment that children can handle themselves with as little teacher participation as possible. Listen, I'm being very gentle with these plants because they're very young, very, very young. What I like to do is approach a child in a real positive way and, and at the beginning of the year be as nurturing and as mother to them as I possibly can be and, and give them a lot of closeness and all the things they need. And then when I see them developing and socially interacting, then I like to step aside and let them go on with their, their life. And um, a lot of times it's a simple thing, like for example, the plant project. Now we have to work this out. Thing now I'm to do this one. The soil was there for them. The plants were there for them. The water was there for them. All the things they needed, and they were their their skill level was appropriate for the project. So they were very capable of handling that for themselves. I sat down with the project. I separated the plants. I talked about the names of the plants. Did you put that marigold out for me? Um, I think Megan needs one. It needs to be lifted out of here. You know what I noticed? I noticed you have lots of soil in your pot. Take some of it out, and then, and then maybe you'll have room for your plant. Did you want this one in, in here, too? Do you want me to put, help you put this in? They need a real nice little nest. They need a plant room for all their roots. Okay, let's see. Will that work? Okay. Now maybe you can gently cover those roots with soil. Are we going to have a little drink? Yeah. Once I discovered that they were into their project, I was very comfortable to move away, look around the room, and find another place where uh, a child maybe would need a little more help. I was wanting somebody to work with here. I organized a whole set of, of the things that children use every day by color. And so they had a basket, and, a, and the basket liner is made out of the same color. Originally, because I didn't find all the different color baskets, we started out with white baskets and the liners with a different color. Um, then we added the magic carpets, which, of course, are a lot of fun for children to use for different things. And their sleeping bags. Which one is yours, Danny, now? I know, but which color are you now? Okay, let's very carefully get your brown basket. Okay, hi. Where's your blanket? Would that help? What that gives me is that I'm able to blend colors into everything that I do. Um, they, and even Heidi can pick out her own color at one years old. And they can, so the thing that fascinates me most about the colors is how my one, one and a half year olds that, that are just becoming very verbal, even if they can't tell you what all the colors are, they can tell you who the colors belong to. They can walk right down the row baskets and say, this is Heidi's color, this is Cody's color, this is Amy's color. And I think that's just fascinating because that of course leads me into, sure, Cody's color is blue. Um, let's get your blue sleeping bag. Let's use the blue magic carpet. Those things make it so easy. So we don't necessarily say, this day we're going to work on the color blue. My color stuff is worked in all day long. It's part of what I do. Okay, now can you all reach your basket? You could all reach it without the chair if you wanted to, couldn't you? Let's try. First we have to put this away, and then we'll color. Um, I know oh, I have a piece of paper. I know, you need to come over to the table. I want to be teal, Diana. Yes, I wanna you want to be teal? Yeah. Yes, what, yeah. I want to be teal. Okay, yeah. Bethany may color a red picture. Diana has to write these down so she remembers them all. And Danny, you want this color. What color is this? Um, no, rose. What? Rose. Danny wants to be rose. And Jennifer wants to be orange. orange. And Jenny's name isn't on the orange list anywhere, is it? Nope. So Jenny gets to have orange. Where's the J for Jenny's name? Okay. And Heidi, what color do you want to be? Here's a paper for Heidi. 
Orange. What color? Pink. She wants to be purple, I think. I do the same thing, you know, with the counting. Uh, we count how many people are here. We count how many napkins we're going to use and that. So it works out. So that they're learning and having a good time. But I'm not having to say, this minute we are going to do colors. Have you counted how many children are here so I know how many plates to fix? How many are out in the other room? Two. Five and two are... Seven. Yep. Yeah, There's eight of them. There's eight people all together. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And some of them have to sit over there. I don't think so. I think that's how we usually sit. <laughs> but you know what? Is Heidi sitting in here? So how many people does that mean we need at the table? Is Heidi sitting in the chair? And there is eight. We only need seven at the table, don't we? Yeah. Give Heidi one. When my mother was here visiting a couple weeks ago, she was just sitting in the other room playing with the children. And I was in one room with another group, and we were playing a game, and then we were picking up the toys before lunch, just the common everyday things we do. And she said, Ruth, you should hear yourself when you're in there. She said, you are always teaching the children. And I don't notice that I'm doing that. Whoa, Mrs. Honky goofed. I spilled. I spilled. Yeah. If we're talking about food, we talk about where it comes from. If we're talking about colors, we'll try to identify them and help the children learn them. Even passing out cups at noon, who's got the blue cup, who has the green cup. All this stuff just comes naturally, I guess. Where do eggs come from? Do who remembers that? We talked about that. I do. Cows. No. Cows. Where do eggs come from? From the store. <laughs> How do they get to the store? Just an egg. Who, who makes eggs? Cows don't make eggs, cows make milk. Milk. Milk, yeah. Do you remember who makes eggs? Yeah. Who the milk, um, the, the milkman. Who lays an egg? Um, the, the chicken. Good! Yeah. They remember. You can crack that now. A chicken lays an egg. And then, Kelly, Kelly, after the chicken lays an egg, then they take the egg to the store. Okay? Excellent. You big kids are getting very good at egg cracking. I did two of them excellent. Mm -hmm. I did one of them. Well, that's one of the easiest things that I find to do with family daycare because family daycare incorporates real life living. Um, and what children need to learn is real life living things. And sometimes it's folding the laundry so that you have clean washcloths when it's time for snack. It's scrubbing the floor. And, and we sometimes will do that if that's what's necessary. Cooking to make food so that we can eat. That's part of real life. And that's an easy part for me to incorporate in. Plus, I think the kids really then get a feeling that this belongs to them, too, because they help take care of it, and it's theirs as well as mine. Are we going to put all the colors together and match them up, or are yeah. we going to no. just fold? Just fold. Just yeah. fold? Just fold? Okay. I can't get any. What happens if I throw some things over to Danny? One gets to the point of children being independent by spending a lot of time modeling. Lots. And one gets to the point of children solving their own problems by spending a lot of time teaching them how to solve problems, giving them options, problem solving with them. I do not believe that kids know how to solve problems because they're four. They have to be modeled that process and they have to be encouraged and, and experience success for them to be good at it. I'm going to sit back here. Yeah. I'm setting the table. The best thing I do is interact with kids. Also, problem solving. I'm, I'm good with problem solving. If they're upset, they're rightfully upset, and we just have to discuss it till we get why they're upset, and then we discuss it till we figure out why they're upset, and then we acknowledge, right, 
you're both upset. Then we look for the solution to that problem. And look, Mandy, look where Karen is. It's not very far. She's kitty corner from you. Yeah, you can touch her. You guys will be able to touch fingers, won't you? If I'm always coming in between, then she'll think that's the normal way. And well, who needs words? Who needs to learn this stuff? There, she's going to take care of this for me. So I figure I'll, I'll always rephrase it for her because it's hard to understand it. Also, I need to rephrase it so she hears the correct way that words go. Um, and I also model to her how one talks to somebody else and how you approach them and what you say. But I'm going to ask her to do it. So she practices and she learns that that's the norm we're looking for. That's real life. That's how people do it. Why don't you tell them? Well, I'm not going to put it in again, so I don't want to sit next to you. Well, I'm not. I'm going to sit next to you. No, but, well, you always promise me things, then you do them. Well, I won't do that, Karen, because I'll be too busy eating. Then I, I always tell them, great, you did a good job telling them what they shouldn't do. Now be sure to tell them what they should do. I... I, I had to stop fighting their natural instinct to say no. Because the little one comes up and wrecks their tower, they're going to say, oh, you really ought to, <laughs> no. They go, no, no, don't wreck my tower. She wrecked my tower. Get out of here. Fine. Give them the broom to say no, to get excited, to have this you know, excitement. That's good for the little one to go, whoa, I did something wrong here. And then tell them what they should do. Give them the appropriate path around it or their options or whatever, tell them what they should do. And you said Amanda would um, sit by me too. No, I didn't. Well, can't switch it. Can't switch it. It'll be too hard. Can you see how hard it is? It's way too hard to switch. You need to leave it how it was. I guess I think that's important with children, that they just know right from the start that that's how you do it. <laughs> and there are lots of things that are their job, and then there's lots of things that are my job, and there's lots of things that I can help them with, and there's lots of things that other children can help them with. Also, when they see other children as helpers, then they see themselves as a helper, too, as somebody that's capable and willing and has a lot to offer. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> she can do that. I guess I can do that, too. And it's time to wash your hands, and then we'll eat. Time to dry your tears, tears, tears. Time to dry your tears, and then we'll eat. Hold on, I'll get you a Kleenex. Modeling appropriate language, encouraging children to use words to describe their feelings, and positively guiding them through the problem-solving process are all techniques teachers can use to help children gain the confidence to solve their own problems. Teachers also need strategies to help guide children through the day and to ease the transition from one activity to another. But you can sit with me over there for a bit, okay? We'll just cuddle for a little while. Annie, come. I think we got enough toast. Let me show you. Come here and see. At the beginning of the year, our transitions are so simple that you shouldn't be able to identify them. Um, uh, we, our circle time is maybe in the in the library corner reading a story and talking about whatever has happened that day. Then we gradually move into the rug area where we're all together. Have you been in the block corner playing? What? And in the kitchen? I notice you've been very busy. And Kendra, I can tell by your shirt that you did a lot of painting today. You did a lot. And you painted with red, didn't you? When we make a transition to the bathroom or to the, to the gym, it's usually on a one-to-one. -one. And how we do that is a simple song, using their name or using the letter of their name or the color of their shoes or the color of their shirt, things that they can totally identify with. I can see everyone's eyes. And I can tell Kendra's are blue. 
And mine are green. green. And yours are green. And mine are green. Yours are green. And yours are very blue. They're as blue as JJ's. And let's see your eyes. Green. I call your eyes hazel, Max. What do you want to buy Blue. And you know what? Here we are together. I think so. Here we are together, together, together. Here we are together, all sitting on the rug. There's Madeline and Max and JJ and Daniel and Peter and Rachel and Casey and David and Kendra and Catherine. Here we are together, all sitting on the rug. And I was looking around this room and we saw a lot of busy people today. I noticed a lot of people painting. I noticed a lot of people making bread and cookies and pizza in the kitchen. Where are we going next? To the gym. To the gym. Okay, are you ready? Okay. We're going on a bear hunt, a bear hunt, a bear hunt. We're going on a bear hunt. Whose name begins with C? Casey. All of a sudden We're you have children going, going down the hall one at a time. Or you have two children that their name begins with K. Two Ks. Catherine and Kendra. So you can you can take you can take transitions and make them a real positive learning situation. Madeline. The teachers and providers we've met today have shared techniques and strategies they've developed over many years of caring for young children. You'll need to adapt these methods for use in your own classroom, and you'll want to develop your own strategies to best meet the needs of the children you care for. The teaching methods and practices you develop should grow out of your definition of what quality care is for young children. First of all, children need to feel good about themselves. They need to have a good self-concept. And uh, secondly, they need to know that they're loved and they're cared about. So a quality program would see adults um, interacting with children and children interacting with adults in a very loving way. It, while, it may, while there may be struggles and there may be some conflict, they know that they love and care about each other, and that's really important. And out of that comes a good feeling about themselves. Um, the third quality I think that's really important is that teachers realize that they are also learners, and they're not the authority who knows everything, but that they learn just as much from children. In all of my years of teaching, I always leave the end of the year thinking that I've learned a lot more than I've taught children. And I think that's really important, is that we're open and, and receptive to new things. How do they feel to you, Evan? Soft. Soft. I always try every day to make something jump out of the ordinary. Something's different. It's not just every day is the same. That something jumps out and goes, wow, I'm alive. Wow, this is interesting. Wow, it's really fun. So if I can look back at the day and see those moments, even if they're just giddy laughing together, or if they're you know smaller moments, or they might be a great discovery or a, an exciting new experience or meeting a new person, well, then I know it's, it's been a good day.